That's right, the, the talk I'm giving today relates back to uh, the work I did for my dissertation last year, and uh, <coughs> which I followed up last year about uh, counterfactuals and the role that the causal structure of discourse plays in that. So, yeah, here's the structure of the talk. I will start um, by explaining why this is sort of a novel approach to counterfactuals. As you may know, there's a huge literature on counterfactuals. I'm taking a slightly different approach. Um, and I'll motivate why this novel approach is um, something you might be interested in. Um, the talk is based on some central data, some um, context in which counterfactual inferences um, are not observed, are cancelled. So I'll go through those Data, some of these data involve additive particles, like we would also. So I'll talk a little bit about the theory of additive particles and how that relates to counterfactuality. Um, I'll talk a bit about conditional perfection, which is a pragmatic phenomenon related to conditionals. Um, maybe that conditionals are interpreted stronger than what they logically assert. And then I'll uh, I'll wrap up and give some um, outlook of what I'm currently working on and what this might lead to in the future. Okay, so yeah, just some background. Um, I guess this is familiar to most of you. Uh, in the study of conditionals, a very um, common distinction that is made is between indicative and subjunctive conditionals. As you can see in one, if Peter took the bus, he was on time. Versus if Peter had taken the bus, he would have been on time. So this is called the indicative versus subjunctive difference. Um, it's maybe not the best name because English has a rather impoverished morphology when it comes to marking subjunctives. Um, other languages have a, a much richer system like Romance languages. Uh, but this is the, the terminology that is sort of standard and there's a lot of work on how they are how they are different, how we can account for that difference um, and so on. Right, so yeah, English does not have a dedicated marker for subjunctive or for counterfactual conditionals. It be very limited <coughs> use and yeah, as you can see the difference between one A and B when you look at the morphosyntax. Uh, is just tense and aspect morphology. In 1b, you have an extra layer of past tense. So a lot of this work on, on conditionals, at least the linguistic work, um, tends to look at the role of tense and aspect morphology, what that contributes. And you can already see that the past tense layer is a bit unusual, different from normal past tense because, for example, it can co-occur with future tense adverbs. So you can say, if John had run the race tomorrow, he would have run. That might be unexpected. How come we can use past tense marking had with a future adverb? Already shows you that something strange is going on with this um, past tense. So these are, are typical issues that uh, linguists in this area look at. Uh, but of course, conditionals are of interest in a much, you know, much wider area than just linguistics. Um, it relates to conditional reasoning, studied by psychologists. And they have found that there are very different reasoning processes underlying um, indicative and subjunctive reasoning. Yeah, here's a very famous example that you've probably seen. If Oswald didn't kill Kennedy, someone else did. It's indicative. Conditional in 3b, you have the subjunctive conditional, and you see that they have very different truth conditions, and a very different claim is made in, in both of them. Right, so typically subjunctive conditionals, so I use subjunctive to name this morphosyntactic 
shape that the conditionals in are often counterfactual, meaning that they give rise to some inference patterns that a certain proposition is false. And typically, we draw two different counterfactual inferences, um, one corresponding to the antecedent of the conditional and one corresponding to the consequent of the conditional. Again, if Peter had taken the bus, he would have been on time. Uh, without further contact, we infer that Peter did not take the bus. Counterfactual inference uh, for the antecedent, and we infer that Peter was not on time. It's the counterfactual inference relating to the consequent. And I will be talking a lot about these, so I use um, CFP and CFQ for those two inferences. You write a conditional as P R O Q. <laughs> CF is for the, the counterfactual inference relating to the antecedent and, and the consequent. Yeah, so let's see, um, as I said, I'm taking a slightly different approach to this area of counterfactuals. Most of the linguistic literature um, focuses on the counterfactuality of the antecedent, the CFP. I did try to explain why uh, 4 implies that Peter did not take the bus. And they don't talk much about C of Q. Maybe they implicitly assume that if you have an account for you know, one counterfactual inference, it will translate or extend to uh, an account of uh, C of Q. Um, I will show that it's not that easy. But I mean, that's one thing you, you notice if you read this, this literature. They always talk about this one uh, counterfactual inference. The second thing is that most literature tends to focus on the internal compositional structure of the condition. That's it. I said they look at the tens and aspect marking in the antecedent to explain why you get that, uh, that inference. And the approach I'm taking is different on these two parts. So I'm focusing on the consequent rather than the antecedent. You'll see that there's good reason to do so in a minute. And the second point is that I will focus on the surrounding discourse. So it's not just the internal parts of the conditional, that certainly plays a role, um, but the larger discourse with surrounding the conditional, the context in which you pronounce it, uh, turns out to be very important in whether or not counterfactual inferences are generated. Um, so those two points are focus on the consequent rather than the antecedent, and uh, focus on the discourse rather than just inside the condition. Those are the two uh, main points that I will, uh, will take and will be a bit different from, uh, from previous literature. Okay, so yeah, I should explain, you know, pointing this out, I should explain why those two different uh, approaches is a good idea. So to motivate that choice, why is the counterfactual inference of the, the consequence important? Yeah, so for a few reasons. First of all, um, you can look at experimental work to see if people actually get those two inferences. I, I told you that they do, but you shouldn't take my word for it. So. Fortunately, we can draw on quite a large body of experimental research, thanks to the psychologists who do that for us. So here's some work where uh, participants were given uh, conditional statements, both indicative and subjunctive, and they were asked what they thought the speaker would uh, meant to imply. That's a pretty simple task, and they had these five choices. Um, so the speaker meant to imply that the antecedent was true, the antecedent was false, the consequent was true, the consequent was false, or they didn't imply anything at all. Right, and first of all, you see a clear difference between indicatives and subjunctives. That's, that's a good thing. Uh, but I want to yeah, point to the fact that the falsity of the antecedent, which is only 2% of the indicatives, 48% in the subjunctive case, so that's the uh, counterfactuality of the antecedent. And almost the same level 
is the counterfactuality of the consequence. We can see that most of these inferences are actually real in experimental settings, they're not just in the heads of linguists. Right, so we should not uh, ignore those. So this second counterfactual inference uh, seems to be real. But there are also some more theoretical reasons um, why we are interested in, in looking at it. So a little bit of background. Uh, it's a, a well-known observation that counterfactual inferences are weak. They are not universally drawn. They're not drawn in all contexts. Um, and this is a very famous point going back to uh, work by Anderson, 1951, who mentioned this famous example, if Jones had taken arsenic, he would have shown just exactly those symptoms, which he does in fact show. So this can be used, this statement can be used in the process of arguing for the truth of the uh, antecedent that he did take arsenic, so it is not counterfactual. And people have taken this example um, to conclude that, well, first of all, there exist uh, subjunctive conditionals that are non counterfactual uh, so you should not confuse those two labels. And you can conclude that CFP is not, you know, it's not a logical entailment, which is a very strong thing, it's not a, a presupposition, because we see that in some constructions or contexts it's <coughs> not dropped. So people have taken from this that it's some kind of pragmatic uh, inference that is um, defeasible. Right, and if you read the literature, you'll see this point made over and over again. I just collected a few references. Everybody mentions this same old example, uh, you know, which is maybe true, but it's also a little f a funny sentence, I think. It's, it's not the most natural sentence that you say rather particular kind of thing where you compare what's in the actual world to some other world. So it's a good example, but it's I think it's, it's rather limited. Nevertheless, everybody takes this for granted and uh, draws the, the conclusions I, I pointed out. Now it turns out that if you look at the counterfactual inference <coughs> for the consequent, there's a much greater variety of contexts where it's can't. Right, so it's not just a single example. Um, you will see that there's a large set of different contexts, a much more natural context, where it gets capped. So the strength of these conclusions is much uh, greater for CFQ than it is for CFB. So that's a reason to study this second inference. It's uh, an empirically much richer problem than just the antecedent. Okay, so yeah, before I, I continue with some more motivation of this uh, problem, let me go through the data, the central data. So once again, these are contexts in which um, the CFQ inference can be cancelled, so showing that it's not a logically uh, strong inference. And I have identified a number of cases in which this happens walk you through them. I divide them into three groups uh, to, to make this easy. So, yeah, there are some conditionals that contain a specific lexical item. Um, and this is where the additive particles come in. So the word also is a typical case, the word still. So some conditionals that have that word in their consequent lead to cancellation of this inference. But there's also a group of conditionals that does not have any specific lexical item. It's just their intonation that uh, results in this cancellation. Right? So you see that this group of contexts is much larger, much more varied than just a single Anderson case. Yeah, so let's go through these three groups. Um, starting with the conditionals with the word also in them. And this has been mentioned in the literature very limitedly. Um, so here's an example due to yeah, Chidu. Um, John is very rich and his wealth has gotten him quite a few friends. If 
If he had been nice, he would also have had friends. We suppose we said John is not nice. But the point is that right, he does have friends, yet we can uh, pronounce this subjunctive conditional in B. Uh, it has the word also in it. It's not counterfactual in the consequent. It's used in this context where it actually is certain to be true. <coughs> So this has been, been mentioned. Now you might wonder, right, it's the word also um, that causes this. However, if you start looking at it, you'll find that not all conditionals with also have this prompt. Right, so here's a different uh, sentence which looks very similar on the surface. So John got married yesterday. If John had gone to the party, he would also have met Linda. But this is also a subjunctive conditional. It also has the word also in its consequent. But this is a regular counterfactual condition, right? He, he did not meet Linda. And we're giving a hypothetical case in which that would have happened. Right, so this is not so easy as it looks. We have to find some, way, some kind of characterization that widens the conditionals in six are different from the ones in seven. Well, then there are some conditionals with uh, the word still in them. Well, I said, if we take it the other road, we would still have been there in time, can be used in a context where we are in fact in time, it just gives you an additional reason for that. And still here has a very similar meaning to also, which is uh, somewhat surprising. And again, there are also conditionals that contain the word still that don't have this property. So, here's my own example. If John had been singing for an hour, then somebody rang at the door. You could say if John hadn't heard the doorbell, he would still have been singing now. Right? That's also a conditional, subjunctive conditional, contains the word still in the consequent. But here, it is a regular kind of factual condition. There's no cancellation of the inference. But we do infer that he's not singing now. Okay, so same problem here. We have to find some characterization. What sets the cases in age apart from the case in mind. And then the third group is a group of context in which a conditional can be uttered. It does not have any specific lexical item, um, but it's due to um, other features of the context in which this inference gets, uh, gets cancelled. I'll mention two of them here. The first one, I agree, is a little uh, far-fetched, but it does work. It's uh, a listing context. Right, so, yeah, if you list things, um, you usually use a, a typical uh, intonation. Uh, and John, and Peter, and Bill, and Mary, and Ed. Uh, there's this, what's called a plateau intonation of all of them. It's called a listing context. And, yeah, it's a little cumbersome, but you can also list conditions, right? If you have a lot of conditional statements, you can list them one after the other. You have a similar type of intonation contour. So here's the context. Suppose that we it's a, a dark night, there are lots of falling stars, and we're outside looking at the falling stars. And you know, Mary went outside at a particular time and saw a falling star. We're very happy. I went outside and I saw a falling star. But Mary doesn't know that you know there were actually lots of falling stars that evening, so it's not a very special thing. Then John can say can pronounce this whole list of conditionals. It's a little crazy, but you could. If you'd gone outside at 9.41, you'd have seen a falling star. If you'd gone outside at 9.54, you'd have seen a falling star. If you'd gone outside at 10.40, you'd have seen a falling star. You see I use a sort of similar intonation there, um, listing intonation. Right, and the point is that all these conditionals, you know, they, have all, they all have their C if Q cancelled. 
Mary did see a falling star, yet we can pronounce the counterfactual conditional. And note if you if you only do one, you don't do the list of it's bad, you know. If John would answer, oh, if you'd gone outside at 941, you'd have seen a falling star. It's really weird because she actually did see a falling star. So there's something about this listing of conditionals that you know, leads to cancellation. It's quite a surprising fact, I think. Yeah, and then finally, the one group that is actually studied in the literature, they're called semi-factuals, uh, quite well known, also in the philosophical literature. Uh, these are a type of conditional that convey the truth of their consequent. And they often start with even if, although that's not required. Well, so you're standing in front of a broken bridge, you can say, even if the bridge was standing, I wouldn't cross basically conveys that you would never cross that bridge, no matter what. It's called a semi-factual. There's no causal relation between the antecedent and the consequent. Of course, you don't have the, uh, the C of Q there. You don't infer that the consequent is false. Right, and there is no uh, lexical item in the, in the consequent. Sometimes you find the word still there. But it's not required, so this is another example of a CFQ cancellation context. One that is not signaled by a specific lexical item. Okay, so we've seen three different groups of contexts in which this inference get cancelled. Some, but crucially not all conditionals that have the word also in their consequence. Some, but not all conditionals, have to put still in their consequence. And then the third group, which is sort of difficult to define, a group of conditionals that has some kind of special intonation, like listing intonation. At this point, we don't know what it is. But we have those three groups where the inference gets cancelled. Right? You see that this is a much, more, much larger group of contexts, and it's they are more natural, especially the ones in group one and two. They're pretty common. You can find them in corpora. So this is a a common situation that the inference gets gets cancelled. Okay, so this leads to two main questions that uh, I will answer. So there's an empirical question. So first of all, what determines whether or not these words also and still have this cancellation effect. You see that only in a proper subset this happens. What is it about those sentences that affects in cancellation? And yeah, how can we characterize the third group? Um, that seems sort of difficult. So that, in other words, is an empirical characterization of these, these contexts. We would like to get uh, to it in a more precise way. And then after that, we have the more analytic question, what property unites the three groups and explains why, in, that, in those cases, uh, you don't have that in It gets cancelled. Okay, so that's the, the main questions that I will, uh, I will answer. So this, yeah, I, this was the, the main data. So just to come back to motivating the problem. So, yeah, one thing I mentioned is this, uh, that it's empirically, empirically richer than the case of the, uh, of the antecedent. In addition to that, this is a uh, part of non-natural meaning, which is highly context sensitive, as we've already seen. And I will present a fairly precise way of studying that phenomenon general what we like to do in pragmatics. And yeah, the analysis will provide a new way uh, to approach counterfactuality. As we will see, we can now use tools from the study of discourse, so the question answer structure of discourse, topic focus structure, and so on. They can now be applied to uh, the area of counterfactuality. So yeah, to areas that are maybe not directly linked, or 
it's not directly clear that they are linked. Uh, we'll see some connections between them. Yeah, and another thing is because this set of cancellation contexts is so varied, and so many different properties, it naturally leads to discussion of other topics. Right, so for example, focus particles, we've seen the presence of also, um, and still, um, we've seen the role of intonation, we'll come to talk about compressive topic, we'll talk about questions and answers, exhaustivity, so all these things are related to the problem and they have branched into separate projects that I've been working on. Uh, and I think, yeah, I mean, there's a huge literature on conditionals, but not so much in connection with these topics. There is not all that much work on conditionals and intonation, conditionals and topic focus structure. So I hope that you know, looking at these problems will also <coughs> lead to work into these uh, other areas. Okay, so these are all linguistic motivations. I know that there are non-linguists in the room, so. Why should you be interested? Well, as I said, there's a lot of interesting counterfactuals from the psychological literature because this underlies conditional and counterfactual reasoning. There's a lot of experimental work in that area. Different, uh, yeah, different mental models have been proposed uh, for these two types of reasoning. And also, in the philosophical literature, uh, people are interested in the relation between counterfactuals and causality. I will have a bit to say about that later. And modal knowledge. So, yeah, I think if we look at not just the counterfactuality of the antecedent, but also of the consequent, we get a better picture of how this counterfactual reasoning works. So, I think it will also be of interest from these other perspectives that are not directly linguistic. Okay, so yeah, I'll first briefly summarize the, the general structure of the argument. It involves quite a few steps, so I think it's good to uh, understand the structure in advance, and then I'll go through some of the steps in more, uh, in more detail. Yeah, so remember that I had this empirical question about the characterization of the context we found and the analytic question about uh, you know, explaining why those contexts lead to cancellation. So here are a few answers that I will uh, propose to these empirical questions. So first, whether or not the word also in the consequence leads to cancellation depends on how it associates with focus. So here we'll look at the focus sensitive properties of also and how it can associate these different uh, constituents within the conditional. And then we have these uh, words, these conditionals with still. I won't talk too much about them. It's uh, sort of similar because still effectively uh, behaves like an additive particle. <coughs> And the story will be quite similar. Um, here it will depend on the scope relation between still and the modal verb. Uh, yeah, this was worked out in more recent work. I had a small paper on this interpretation of still. Uh, so I'll, yeah, I'll focus on, on the word also today, but it's a, quite a similar idea. And then we'll see that, see if Q can also be cancelled in certain discourse configurations, so depending on the question of the discussion and the topic focus structure of the conditional. Right, so that's the third group of, uh, of cancellation context. Okay, and then, yeah, we'll move on to the theoretical proposal, the analytic question that I raised. And here I like to break it up into three separate claims. The first claim is that these uh, CFQ cancellation contexts 
They can be characterized by having a pragmatic property in common, namely that the context in which they are uttered makes more than one antecedent state. And I call this a multiple cause context, and multiple causes for the same outcome. This is where the causal structure of the discourse comes in. So that's the first claim that I will defend. We'll see that it's closely related to the focus properties of also. Okay, so that gives you the characterization that we were looking for. This rather varied set of contexts turns out to have a unifying property in terms of this uh, causal structure. Then the second claim says something about how the counterfactual inference is generated in the first place. I talked about C of Q. And I will adopt an old idea that conditional perfection is a necessary ingredient for this inference to arise. Right, this is a very different story than uh, the C of P, so the, the antecedent. Uh, but this goes back to, to older work. Yeah, one of the key predictions here is that when conditional perfection does not apply, and the literature has identified many contexts in which there is no conditional perfection, we ex predict that there is no C of Q inference. So that will basically be my explanation. The lack of C of Q is the result of a lack of conditional perfection. Okay, and then the third claim connects the two. Uh, I argue that multiple cause contexts do not have conditional perfection. And then it sort of closes the story, so all those contexts that we have identified are multiple cause contexts. If I claim C, they don't have conditional perfection, and therefore the pragmatic inference does not arise. Okay, so yeah, I think it's easiest to think about it. These three separate claims. And that's basically the answer to the analytic question. Okay, but I'm, yeah, I'll start with this first point here. Um, talking about this first group of cancellation contexts, the conditionals that have the word also in them and arguing that it depends on how it associates with focus that determines whether or not such a conditional leads to the cancellation of the kind of factual inference of the concept. Okay, so within this point I have two goals. I want to show uh, this relation to focus association and the second part is that I want to show that this relates to the causal structure in the form of multiple cause contexts. Okay, and to explain this, I set up a context which makes it easier to think about these uh, different sentences because we can construct minimal pairs. So imagine that there is a game show. It's just an easy context because it's very clear what is the relation between causes and consequence. Right, so it's a game show, uh, participant opens one of these five boxes, can't see their content and wins the prize that's inside the box. Right, and once the lids are removed, um, this is their content. Okay, so now people can make different claims about this situation. So suppose that Mary participated in this show, she picked box A, so she won $100. And now you can make different claims about what would have happened if she had opened a different box. Okay, so first of all, 12A, you can say, if Mary had picked box B, she would also have won a laptop. If she had picked box B, she would also have won a laptop. Here the intonation is, is crucial. Right, and that's true. That's a true statement. If she had picked box B instead of A, in addition to the $100, she would have won a laptop. You can also say 12B, that's also a true statement. If 
invariant fixed box D, she would also have one hundred dollars. Box A and box D are the same. So these are two true statements about the game show, about uh, what would have happened if Mary had picked, picked a different box. But crucially, they are very different when it comes to the counterfactual inferences. So 12a is a regular counterfactual conditional because she did not actually win a laptop. It's a context where the consequence is indeed false. She only won the hundred dollars, not the laptop. But 12b is one of those cases that I pointed at. In fact, she did win a hundred dollars, but we point out a different cause for that. Right? Box D is a different way in which the same outcome would have occurred. Okay, so this is just the same observation that some but not all conditionals will also have this effect of cancellation of the inference. So this is sort of a nice minimal pair. And you can already see that the difference is not in the words, but it's in the, the focus structure. And in 12a, I have a pitch exit on laptop. She would also have on a laptop. In 12b, the pitch exit is on the focus particle also. And that already hints at the idea that I will defend that it has to do with the focus association. Okay, so what do I mean by the focus associated also? Also is an additive particle, just like the word two in English. And an additive particle associates with a constituent in the sentence that we call the focus associate, because typically it is focus marked, you can see that in the prosody. So 13 is sort of a standard example. Peter also invited Mary to his birthday party. Mary here is the associate of also. Sort of introduces a presupposition that he, Peter invited some other person to his birthday party, some alternative to Mary. Well, you can see that the focus associate is typically focus marked. There are some exceptions. In this case, it works. And the semantic role of the focus associate is to introduce alternatives, as I said. Uh, <coughs> what an additive particle does is introduce some kind of presupposition. People disagree on the precise status of that, but some kind of presupposition that for an alternative to Mary, uh, the sentence is true. So Peter also, Peter invited X to his birthday party for some alternative X to Mary. And so that's what I mean by the, the focus association. Now let's look back at these at this minimal pair uh, and let's try to identify what is the focus associate of also in the two cases. Well so here is again the first sentence, uh, sort of regular counterfactual. If Mary picked box B, she would also have on a laptop. Here the focus associate is the word laptop, which is nicely marked by intonation. Um, it is, it does carry a pitch accent, it's focus marked. And indeed it generates the uh, alternatives, because here we're comparing different prizes. Right? A hundred dollar prize versus the laptop versus some other prize. And yeah, I call this local also because the the link between the focus particle and its associate is a clause bound uh, link. So it's, as you can see by the arrow, it's in the same clause. So it's a, a local relationship between those two things in the sentence. Crucially, if you look at the second example, a sort of special context where the inference gets cancelled, we see a different structure. Right, remember, if Mary had picked box D, she would also be one hundred dollars. What are the relevant alternatives in this case? Well, there are different antecedents, so different ways to win a hundred dollars. So picking box A is one, picking box D. Those are the relevant alternatives. 
And we can see that it's not local anymore. Here the link between the word also and its focus associate is going over a, cloud, a clause boundary because it associates with material in the antecedent of the condition. Right? And this will turn out to be a crucial difference. So we have the local also, which is the familiar sort, just like in our first example in 13, where the focus particle associates with some constituent in the same clause. And these cases where the inference gets cancelled, it associates with material that is farther away, that is the antecedent clause of the condition. Okay, and my claim is that this is a close relationship, so only the presence of non-local also, only when this relation is the associated constituent is a non-local relationship, only then um, you get the cancellation of C and P. This is the desired characterization. Um, let's see if that works by looking at some other examples of different associates of also, both local and non-local ones, to see if that supports this claim. So here we have some other examples of local also. Right, so in my first example is associated with the direct object, she won a laptop. But of course it doesn't have to, it can associate with the subject. If John picked box A, he would also have won $100. And it associates with the subject, he. But it's still a local relationship and indeed we find that the inference is triggered in the normal way. Right? In the actual situation, John did not win $100. Uh, it can even be on the verb, it's a little strange, but uh, you know, she married, was used to giving away laptops, but now she won one, so <coughs> if Mary had picked box A, she would also have won the laptop, as opposed to giving away laptops. But again, a local relationship, and we do find that C of Q is triggered in a normal fashion. Okay, so two other examples of local instances of also, where we do find the normal inference. So, so far, so good. We should also look at another example of non-local also. As in my example, we just looked at different opening different boxes. Which is just part of the antecedent, but it can also associate with the entire antecedent. So, Mary, again, Mary picked box A and she won $100. If she had done something else completely, if Mary had won the lottery, she would also have won $100. Right, so now we're not comparing opening different boxes with just different events. Right, that doesn't matter, it's still cancels the implication, or the, the inference that uh, she did not win the hundred dollars. Okay, so this, uh, this supports our claim that whether or not you get cancellation depends on whether or not the association is local or non-local. Okay, so, yeah, note that this is not yet an explanation, this is just an empirical generalization. I have not yet explained anything, I just observed a number of different uh, conditionals and stated this generalization. Okay, and in the second part we'll see what is the theoretical value of that. Okay, so that was my first goal in this section indicate the relation with the association is focused. Now the second question was how does this relate to causal structure? Right, that's not obvious. And here the story starts from again looking at the intonation contour of this conditional and what is special is that in this case of non-local also, 
the focus particle gets the pitch x. Once again, you say, if Mary had picked box D, she will also have won $100. The pitch x is on also, which is unusual. Right, it's not the canonical case. The regular intonation, as we've already seen, is the one where the focus associate is focus marked. That's where the name comes from. I invited Mary, I also invited Bill. That's, that's the standard case where the pitch action goes to Bill. Uh, however, the literature has, previous literature has identified one group of cases where you do find this unusual the special intonation where you find that the focus particle is accented, uh, not relating to conditionals. And these are called post post stress additive particles, as in 18. So John lives in France and Mary lives in France too. Mary also lives in France. Right, these are cases, just ordinary sentences, but for some reason here we do find a pitch accent on the additive particle instead of their associate. Right? And this, of course, uh, is interesting from our perspective because maybe it's the same phenomenon why it also gets accented in the conditional as in these cases that have already been studied. So that's where the, the analysis starts by pointing out this uh, connection. Yeah, and the idea here, that's why they're called post-post stress additive particles, is that it has to do with their syntactic position. Um, right, in 18, A and B, the focus particle follows its associate in, in the syntax, in the word order. And the idea is that that plays a role. The second thing that plays a role is the, the topic focus structure of the discourse. Contrastive topic hypothesis by uh, Manfred Krivka. So the associated constituent of post-post stress additive particles is the contrastive topic of the clause in which they occur. Right, so that's the claim. The associate of also in 2 and 18 is a contrastive topic. Now, what do I mean by that? Uh, what is a contrastive topic? Well, the just a topic is, uh, you can look at it from different uh, perspectives. In most cases, it corresponds to a specific intonation contour. Which, yeah, this is the uh, Toby marking, if you don't know that, it's sort of a rise for rise um, contour. I'll try to pronounce a few examples in a minute. But contrastive topics have a particular phonetic contour associated with them. In terms of the information structures, in terms of the question answer structure of the discourse, a contrastive topic signals a partial answer to a question. We'll see that too. And in terms of semantics, um, just like focus, it introduces alternatives, but it introduces second order alternatives, so in addition to the focus alternatives, you have a second level of alternatives that is introduced by this contrastive top. Okay, so let's look at some examples that show you the, the difference between focus and contrastive topic. I suppose somebody asks, do any of our students live in France? Then you can just say, Mary does. constitutes a complete answer, so Mary is the one who lives in France. Um, that's 19A. But you can also say, do any of our students live in France? Mary does. As you see that I have this um, contour associated with contrastive topic, Mary does. That indicates that it's a partial answer. So we say Mary lives in France, and maybe other students do as well, but I have not answered that part of the question. Right, so you see the two, the first two uh, points here, you see the contour and you see the information structural connections and partial answer to the question. 
Right, another very typical situation where this occurs is if you have a conjoined question. Right, so where do John and Mary live? It's basically two questions conjoined. You're asking something about John and something about Mary. And you say John is in France. And again, you have the contrastive topic marking on John, indicating that this answer is partial. It only answers your question about John, but not about Mary. Right, so, yeah, contrastive topic is, is connected to a partial answer. It has this rise, fall, rise, intonation, contour. <coughs> okay, so that's just the background. Um, and it, yeah, remember this hypothesis says that these accented focus particles, post, post, stress, and particles, they associate with a contrastive topic. Right now, one case in which you can see that is in, in this example. Again, we have a conjoined question, where do John and Mary live? Um, then you can say, John lives in France, and Mary lives in France too. Right? Or you can say, John lives in France, and Mary lives in Spain. Right? So this, this sort of conjoined question you, you typically find Contrastive topics. But and again, you can look at the reciprocity and the type of question that the sentence answers. Okay, so now we may, we may wonder does this extend to conditionals? That right? is the, the conditional case that I've presented with the pitch accent on also is that the same thing? Is that also a case of a, an additive particle associating with a contrastive topic? Well, we cannot automatically assume that because conditionals are syntactically more complex. As we've seen, it can associate with constituents outside of, the, uh, of their own clause. So, yeah, let's look at some examples. And we're mimicking here this, the conjoined question structure. Right in, now in the form of conditionals. And we find that you have a very similar uh, prosody again. So if you open box A, you would have $100. <coughs> if you open box B, you would have $100. And again, this sort of answers an implicit question about what happens if you open box A or B. And say something about those two options with contrastive topic marking in the antecedent. Okay, my claim is that this is indeed what is happening in that uh, in that case when you have also so twenty three if you have the same the same price the same thing in the consequent if you had open box A you have one hundred dollars. And if you'd open box B, you'd also have $100. Right, so I claim that that second conjunct, that's basically the sentence that I've uh, pointed out to you. Right, that's the, the case where the inference gets cancelled. Is similar in prosody and also in the question structure to the familiar case in 22. So it licenses this uh, contrastive topic marking. Yeah, I'm leaving out some steps here. You can formally uh, look at the question structure and make this a little more formal. But yeah, for now, uh, we'll just look at these two properties. Because there is a prosodic similarity and a semantic similarity. So we see that in 23 also indeed, remember it's non-local also, so it associates with material in the antecedent, and we do have evidence that that antecedent is a contrastive topic. So we do have the same sort of marking as in the post-post stress edited particles. Okay, so that's our, our in terms of conclusion, non-local also 
associates with a contrastive topic in the antecedent of the image. Okay, I still have not said anything about causal structure, but it's coming. Right, this is the first step. We now know something about the topic focus structure of the conditional. That's important. Now we can look at the different alternatives that are generated. Right, and this is where the, the difference between local and non-local also becomes important. Right, because we've just concluded that uh, non-local also, so the stressed, the pitch accent it also associates with uh, material in the antecedent, and that's the semantic role of the addressor's topic marking is to introduce the alternative. So the, the relevant alternatives are different uh, antecedents for the same concept. Right? B1 then Q, B2 then Q, B3 then Q, those are the alternatives that are being generated because of this configuration of the contrastive topic and the antecedent. Right, and this is what I call a multiple cause context. So the salient alternatives are alternative causes for the consequent Q. That's in our example, opening box A versus opening box B versus opening box C. Those are different causes for winning a certain prize. Okay, and in this particular configuration, those alternatives are made salient. So this is indeed a multiple cause context. Right, so this is the link between the topic focus structure, which generates alternatives in a specific position, and why we have multiple causes. So what about the, uh, the local also? Remember, that's the regular case where we do get the normal inference. And that's the case where the associative also is in the same consequent clause. So there you have different types of alternatives kinds of alternatives. Right? Because of their syntactic location, it's of a different uh, configuration. If P then Q1, if P then Q2, if P then Q3, those are the alternatives. So this is not different causes for the consequent, these are different outcomes for a certain antecedent, so different price in this case. Right? So this does not give rise to a multiple cause. Okay, so we see that there is a link between focused association and the structure of alternative causes versus other types of alternative. Okay, so this you know, sort of completes the, the second goal, the, the link with multiple cause contexts. So before I move on to um, the rest of the, uh, the argument about conditional perfection, I'll come back to one of the other cancellation contexts, which shows that this studying additive particles actually gives you more than just the additive particles. So I'll talk about the listing contexts. will appear suddenly out of this discussion. And again, we're following the, the narrative in the literature about these uh, stressed additive particles. So one reason why they're interesting is because of their non-standard intonation pattern. We've talked about that. Another property that people are interested in it is because these particles seem to be obligatory. obligatory. Right? So what you can't say is John lives in So the question is, where do John and Mary live? You can't say John lives in France and Mary lives in France. Right? Because that intonation is a strange sentence. Where do John and Mary live? John lives in France and Mary lives in France. That's really weird. So you cannot leave out the additive particle in that sentence. The question is, why is that obligatory? It doesn't really have any uh, an issue contribution to the meaning. 
So that's uh, one thing that we will look at. Yeah, and I call this the repeated focus constraint. It's not really an established name, but so that's the informal thing. So if you have a structure with a compressive topic and a focus, um, you must have, you cannot repeat the, focus, the identical focus values without having a different function. The constraint on that. Now, crucially, it depends on the discourse structure whether or not the word also, the word to is obligatory. Right, so again, this goes back to Krivka 99, or the sentence is like 26. But if you look at different discourse structures, like in 27, you have the exact same sentence, same in the sense that it's the same words, but it's fine, right? If somebody asks who lives in France, you can answer John lives in France and Mary lives in France. Perfectly fine, perfectly natural. Note that it's the exact same sequence of words as in 25A. John lives in France and Mary lives in France. So it was my intonation that made the sentence bad. And the, the configuration of the discourse. So not, nothing about the words, it's something about the discourse structure. Right, and that makes it interesting for our perspective. Right, because it shows that you can have multiple course contexts even without the word also. In 27 you don't have to have the word also. But you still have these different uh, alternatives, John and Mary. So the question is can we go back to conditional and construct a similar case where we have a multiple course context but one that does not involve the word also. Right, and one case in which you see this is in listing contexts. Here they come back. So again, listing contexts have been mentioned in relation to obligatory additive particles. Right, so 27 was one case where the additive particle is not obligatory. Listing contexts are a different one. But you can say so many friends that live in France, John lives in France, Mary lives in France, Peter lives in France, Ed lives in France. Again, I'm using the uh, listening intonation, and I don't need an additive part. Right? So this is a different configuration where the repeated focus constraint um, does not apply. Right? You don't, that's fine. You don't need an additive particle, you can just say that with that particular intonation. And that's a very nice thing because now we have an explanation, uh, again, going back our parallel to conditionals, we have an explanation why uh, 29, a repeated version of that uh, listing context. You know, if you list all those conditionals, so it's cumbersome and it's possible, it's the direct equivalent of 28, and you don't need an additive particle, but it is a multiple cause context, as you can see, you list all these different uh, causes for seeing a falling star. Right, so we actually get a more general characterization. It's not, it's not specific to the word also or to additive particle. It is a more general thing. You get these very nice parallels between the study of additive particles and the study of conditionals. It's a nice connection. Right, so we are quite far on our way to characterizing these different contexts. They look like very different sort of animals. You know, the things with also a listing context and things with still, but you see how they come together, especially when you realize that still can behave as an additive particle. It fits into the same <coughs> the same story. Okay, so that's the, the first the, the A claim in my, in my story. The CFQ cancellation contexts are multiple course <coughs> contexts. Okay, so now the second step is 
to give an account of how this inference arises in the first place. I haven't said anything about that. How does CFQ come about in, in normal sentences? And this is where the uh, conditional perfection comes in. Right, so this is the, the second theoretical claim. Conditional perfection is a necessary ingredient for CFQ to arise. Uh, this is not my own idea. This goes back to about 1971, a long time ago, but this was only a squib in inquiry, three pages, where he sort of points to this idea, but it hasn't really worked out. And it hasn't really been picked up since, which is interesting. But the idea that he proposed was, let me simplify it as follows. Right, so suppose you utter a conditional as P and a Q. You have the counterfactuality of P, right, for which you need some kind of story, but concentrating on the consequent now, so not P. It's the counterfactuality of P. And then if you have conditional perfection, which again, we'll see some examples in a minute, is the strengthening of conditionals to biconditionals. So that's to strengthen if P then Q to if not P then not Q. Of course, it doesn't follow logically, but it's a pragmatic strengthening. And then by modus ponens, you include not Q. Okay, and that's the counterfactuality of the consequent. This is a very nice idea because you know, it does not. You only have to have an account of the counterfactuality of P, and then by general pragmatic reasoning, you get the second inference. Right? But yeah, stepping back for a bit. Oh, yeah. So, um, as I said, the key prediction that Cartoon doesn't make this point is that when, for whatever reason, you don't have conditional perfection, and we'll see that there are many such cases. You predict that you don't have the uh, inference C of Q, right? Because the second premise is disappears, and then you cannot conclude not Q. Right? So that's a very strong prediction, and that is the one I use. So it forms an explanation for the cancellation of C of Q as a result of the lack of conditional perfection. That's basically the, the story we will. Uh, we will have. Yeah, before I move to that, um, you know, yeah, if you look at accounts for C and P, as I said, linguists would like to have a parallel account, the same explanation for C and P and for C and Q. We should say something about why that is not um, feasible. Right, and this is a large literature which I will not go into in detail, but just briefly, there are many different accounts that have been proposed to explain why the antecedent is counterfactual. Right? In the older literature, there were what I would call non-compositional accounts, so they just associated subjunctive marking, whatever that is, with, with this inference. And then later on, people started to associate this with more compositional accounts and proposing that there are counterfactual markers inside the antecedent. There are many different variants of this. So some people think that the past tense is the origin of this inference that gets interpreted in a different way, in a modal sense. So this is, these are probably fake past tense theories or some other pragmatic uh, interpretation. And you might think that this explanation can just carry over to the consequent. Right? Change some things. That would be a nice thing. <coughs> I have argued that that doesn't work. Um, and yeah, in the interest of time, I don't go into the details. But basically, the point, the problem is that you know most of these theories depend on the 
quantificational structure of conditionals, which is asymmetric. <coughs> so the antecedent uh, is the restrictor of the quantifier while the consequent is in its nuclear scope, and you cannot simply invert that. So yeah, there are technical reasons why we cannot extend these accounts uh, straightforwardly to an explanation of C of Q. And that's why the uh, Cartunen's proposal is, is a nice way to, to explain it. Okay, so that's the story I will adopt. Yeah, so let's look a bit more at conditional perfection. So first of all, this should not be misparsed. Conditional perfection is the perfection of conditionals, not perfection subject to conditions. And it's the strengthening, the pragmatic strengthening of conditionals to biconditionals. And here's the classic example that every work on conditional perfection mentions. If you mow the lawn, I will give you five dollars. You typically infer that if you don't mow the lawn, I won't give you five dollars. Right? Even though that does not follow logically. That's conditional perfection. And of course, conditional perfection is context dependent. It does not always occur. It's sometimes cancelled. So here are some examples. No conditional perfection occurs in semi factuals. Even if John goes home, I won't come. You don't get the perfected implicature. Of course, so called biscuit conditionals, um, if you've heard that, they don't get perfected. If I say if you're hungry, there are biscuits in the cupboard, you don't infer that if you're not hungry, there are no biscuits in the cupboard. No perfection of biscuit conditionals. Uh, and other counterexamples have been mentioned. Right, so this is again sort of the feasible pragmatic inference that occurs in some contexts, but not in all. And yeah, I'm making a new claim about this. I say that this is how the two ends meet. I say that conditionals in multiple cause contexts do not trigger conditional perfection. No, no, and speed up. Yeah, so this claim I think is pretty intuitive. There's some experimental work that if you give people multiple uh, premises, multiple antecedents, they do not get this perfected inference. So there is experimental support for the uh, for this claim, and in fact, it has been implicitly mentioned in the literature. All these people writing about conditional perfection say that if there are additional causes, additional antecedents, you don't get the inference. And it's sort of amusing. You can see what people come up with for different reasons to win five dollars, to earn five dollars, like cleaning up the garage, washing my car. Painting the garage, doing the dishes. You know, everybody mentions this, and if there's an additional cause, an additional way to earn five dollars, you don't have to perfect it. Right? But nobody has actually made that generalization that multiple causation blocks conditional perfection. Right? So, yeah, we would like to um, derive this restriction in a more formal way. Again, this leads into a lot of older literature on how conditional perfection is explained. <coughs> so classic Gricean accounts have been proposed. Uh, more recently, conditional perfection has been linked to exhaustification. In fact, it goes back to Hulendek and Stockholm's dissertation on questions and answers. Uh, but it has been picked up recently by Herberger, for example. The idea is that conditional perfection is a type of exhaustification. Right, so this happens in, uh, in answers. So if you say, why, who did you invite to the party? I invited Mary. If you only invited Mary, that's the result of exhaustification. And the idea is that conditional perfection is the same sort of thing. If you mow the lawn, I will give you $5, and only if you mow 
right? And technically, this is obtained by applying this uh, covert operator, covert only operator to the, to the second conjunct. So that's the interpretation of a perfected condition. And crucially, whether or not you have this exhaustification is a pragmatic choice. Right? And this is well known from the literature on questions and answers. And in this course, you have certain questions that uh, require exhaustive answers. There are also questions that have mentioned some answers. So where can I buy a Italian newspaper, famous example? is not an exhaustive answer. So it depends on the context whether or not you apply this exhaustification operator. So a similar story can be given for the conditions. Right? The claim is that in a multiple cause context where multiple antecedents are salient, you do not apply this operator. P1 and P2, maybe more uh, different antecedents for the consequence the contradiction is that exhaustification. So, we, yeah, we can link conditional perfection with the multiple cause context. Okay, and you do get some additional predictions, right, again, from this literature on the questions. So, what is the conditional counterpart of the mentioned song question? For example, those are the things you can. You can do that. Okay, so yeah, that basically concludes the argument, right? So it's sort of a, involves a lot of a lot of steps, uh, characterizing the cancellation contexts as uh, multiple cause contexts. So by looking at their, the causal structure of the discourse, and then linking the causal structure to conditional perfection which is a necessary ingredient for the inference to arise. Okay, so, okay, conclusion. You know, this is a rather new view of counterfactuality. I've been concentrating on the consequent and the role of discourse. You see how important they turned out to be. We see that counterfactuality is focus sensitive. It depends on how words like also associate with focus, the question-answer structure plays a role, as we have seen, uh, and more generally, the causal structure plays a role. 